All right, so hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. I know it's a little bit hard after the breakfast, <laughs> the break. All right, so my name is Dimitrios and uh, I'm from Greece and uh, here are a few things about me. So uh, I'm engaged in computer security since uh, 2002. I was a member of one of the first reverse engineering groups back in Greece and I started my career as a network security engineer for about 10 years. Then I jumped into developing for almost five years. And the last uh, six years, I focused mainly on mobile security, while before I joined Microsoft's uh, threat intelligence team as a senior security researcher, I was leading another team which was conducting malware reviews for the Google Play Store. All right, so let's jump right into the outline of this briefing. And uh, first of all, we're going to talk about uh, the actual purpose of this presentation. What was the main uh, reason behind this initiative and why we decided to talk and research about uh, advertisement is the case in the first place. And uh, in order for someone to have a good grasp on our findings and understand them in depth, I guess uh, it's good to have some basic understanding regarding web use. So we're going to uh, touch, let's say, the dynamic uh, angle of, the, of this powerful component. Then we're going to go through our uh, showcases uh, we're going to summarize our results, and uh, finally, we're going to end this briefing with conclusions and takeaways. All right, so before we start, I want to get something straight regarding this uh, research and what this research is about and what is not about. I will start with what is not about. So it's not about pointing fingers to vendors regarding their uh, security policies and how they handle users' private, uh, private, private info and this kind of stuff. And it's not about me expressing my opinion, uh, which SDK for use better to use. Um, so, and the other thing actually is uh, the fact that I'm not against using this kind of SDK is due to the fact that I totally understand that developers have somehow to monetize their work. Um, so making use of them is one way, I mean, to do such a thing. And uh, before you start wondering why, why we are here in the first place, so it's all about Awareness, it is about uh, letting you know about a couple of stuff which might not be that obvious when it has to choosing such uh, an advertisement as decay. And by the way, uh, do we have um, Android developers here? No? <laughs> All right, anyway. Any security researchers who are related to Android developers? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's fine. All right, so... A few general things, of course, about uh, SDKs. Uh, we all know it's not about reinventing the wheel, which means we can uh, save time and effort, we can reduce development cost, uh, easy to integrate, maintain and update, of course. And they have the disadvantages like data and privacy concerns, vulnerabilities that they might introduce to our uh, code base, although we don't need them, we can reduce our own. And uh, the other thing, which is most important, is lack of transparency and third-party code that we have to trust. We have a trust code which is not ours, right? And we have to import the specific code within our own code base. So many of you, like the guys that <laughs> said before, might say that, you know, we have uh, researchers, we have uh, reverse engineers, we can analyze the specific code, and if something is going on, definitely we're going to find out, right? when we are using such a library. And actually this is, there are people that do that. Although as you are going to see, this is not that obvious as uh, you might think. And um, I'm going to bring up this topic at the end of this briefing, but before I do that, I'm going to give you some context regarding web views. All right, so a web view is a system component which enables developers to display uh, web content within their app. Imagine something like a, customized browser where the developer has the power to change the uh, look but also the behavior of it. And actually it's very powerful since uh, even development frameworks like React Native or uh, Cordova, Ionic Cordova, they are based actually on the specific, uh, let's say, component. Uh, the user is pretty much simple, so the only thing that someone has to do is just to use a web view, create a web view, and then load uh, the content, I mean the website or web content in general to a specific component and it will be displayed within the app. Now as I said, uh, the developers can't change the behavior and the look, but we are mostly interesting, interested about the behavior, I guess, in our case. 
So there are a couple of settings that someone can modify in order to alter the specific behavior. And the first one that we're going to talk about is content access. Uh, for those who are not, let's say, familiar with Android, and I guess there are <laughs> a lot here. So for those who are not familiar, Android shifted from file URIs to content URIs, which means that uh, when apps want to share files between them, they're going to use uh, schemes like the one that you see in the, in the screen right now. So they can just uh, share something, a file, for example, content in general using this kind of uh, URIs. I'm sure that most of you that uh, used or are using, I mean, Android device have seen such a URI, for example, when you try to open uh, a file from the external directory or something like that. Uh, you're going to see this content URI in the browser. All right, uh, when it comes down to security issues regarding this uh, kind of uh, access, I won't say there is a much, there's much of a risk here. Due to the fact that when these content providers are correctly configured, they don't bring, let's say, a lot of issues. All right, so uh, the next one, I guess, is not of much of a big surprise. Someone can enable or disable JavaScript execution within the web view with uh, this specific call, so JavaScript enabled, and uh, that's it. Now, when it comes to security considerations regarding JavaScript execution, I guess we are all familiar about uh, these kind of things. Um, I would say that uh, if you don't need to display some kind of dynamic content within your, uh, let's say, web view, better keep it disabled, because it's disabled. All right. Now, the next one is a bit more interesting. And uh, can allow a web view to load files, right? So imagine we have a file in the private directory of the app, then uh, if we try to load the specific file, we're going to get uh, access denied due to the fact that this setting is disabled by default. So we can't load by default files to a web view. That's the point. We can change that, as I said before. We can use a set allow file access, set it to true, and then we'll be able to do such a thing. We can load the file from, uh, since we have access, by the time that we have access to it. All right, so what about security issues that might occur from these kind of settings? Uh, there are a lot, actually, although the one that I'm going to refer right now was uh, was popular before Android 11, where uh, some restrictions regarding the external storage were introduced. So imagine we have a legitimate app, a victim app, say the way you want, which loads files from the external directory, then we might have another app which has read-write access to the external directory. We can modify the content so the, uh, let's say, legitimate app, the victim app, will display and use content which is controlled by malware. Right? Okay, and now we are going to the most interesting stuff. All right, so the next setting is uh, file access from file URLs. So what that means is, um, I guess most of you are aware of, uh, same origin policies and this kind of stuff and what it represents. For those who don't, same origin policy, let's say, defines how content which is loaded from a specific origin can access another uh, file, I mean, or content which is loaded from another origin. Now, when it comes to file URIs, uh, to de determining the origin of a file is implementation dependent. Although mainstream browsers like Chrome or Firefox, they follow strict rules when it comes to origins of files, which means that if two files, even if two files are, belong to the same directory, they consider to be from different origins. And this is exactly what happens. Here we have a file, let's say the a.html, which has the JavaScript code, uh, let's say, and which tries to read another file from the same directory, which is called secret. So if we try to do such a thing without this setting enabled, we're going to get the error as expected. Interestingly, though, uh, web views enable developers to change this setting, and uh, so the developer can decide if one file can have access to another file. And this is done by this setting, set allow file access from file URLs. If we set it to true, then this can happen. For example, the file B can access file A. The only condition in the specific case is that both files Actually, the app which uh, has the specific web view must have to both uh, access to both of these files. That's the only condition. So by the time that this stands, one file can read another file. Uh, risks, of course, 
as you understand, now the uh, file that we were talking about before uh, can read, of course, our secret and can do whatever it wants with the content. Can send it, can expedite it and send it out of the device. All right. So the next one, that's the last one. <laughs> so the next one is universal uh, access from file URLs. And what that means is now files which are loaded to web use have access to any kind of scheme. So they have access to uh, file schemes, content schemes, even HTTP, HTTPS schemes. And why this is bad? Let's take another example. Imagine we have this file now, myfile.html, which has the following code that performs a request to a server. And usually there is a, I wouldn't say, I mean, there is something which I noticed in many web users, uh, uh, developers try to um, implement custom authentication when it comes especially to web views, when they want to add some headers and all this kind of stuff. So it is of high possibility that this specific request must be authenticated only due to the fact that it's loaded from the web view. All right, so uh, the result from this request can be written from the specific file which might contain private user info or, you, or info which should be delivered only to authenticated users. All right, so once again, it can read the request, can read the reply, actually, and send it exfiltrated data. All right. And uh, if you think that things cannot be <laughs> worse, think twice. We have the JavaScript interfaces, which JavaScript interface uh, has something unique. So it can, let's say, bridge the Java codes from an app with the JavaScript code, which is loaded to the web view. Simply said, we can use uh, this method, that JavaScript interface. We can inject a Java object to the web view, and then we can give uh, a name to this object. After that, the specific object can be accessible from the JavaScript code, which is loaded to the web view. To give you an example, we have this class. It has this uh, execute code from JS. It's a little bit extreme case, but let's say it can happen. So now, this, imagine that we are creating an object of this class. We are injecting it to the web view. So the web view, now actually, actually the code which will be loaded to the specific web view will have access to uh, the specific, let's say, object and will be able to execute code from the JavaScript. All right? Okay. So now that we have a basic understanding regarding web views, I mean, just a summary of them, and uh, let's talk about another fact. So Android developers have another bad habit. And this is to store users' private info in clear text in the, in the app application's private directory. That uh, info may include uh, tokens, uh, uh, emails, uh, even passwords sometimes. And despite the fact that this sounds a little bit strange and a little bit bad, it's not always. Due to the fact that Android applications are sandboxed, each one is a distinct Linux user, so one application cannot read data from another application, so okay, it's fine. By the time that, uh, let's say, there's no some kind of uh, vulnerability that may allow another app to read data from another app internal directory. So with this thing in mind, all right, we said that uh, when we are importing code to our own app, we can review it and if there is some kind of a Java native call, let's say, which tries to access this kind of files, we, we will be able to identify it due to the fact that when it comes to Android, when we decompile the code, we're going to get something which is very close to the actual code, right? Now, let's take, though, the following case. Imagine that we are importing a, an SDK which has a web view with all these features that I showed you before. So what can happen? In a glimpse of an eye, this... SDK can download the file, can read the rest of the files of the app that it's, it belongs to, it can send them to an external server. And the only way to catch such a thing, to identify such a thing, is to constantly monitor the specific, let's say, the, the communication of uh, the web view with uh, its server, right? There's no other way, because it can hide the tracks, it can download the file, it can overwrite it, or it can use a JavaScript interface just to delete it. And, um, all right. Now let's move to the main part. The advertisement is the case. So, uh, advertisement is the case. 
our libraries which enable developers to monetize their work, as I said in the beginning of the briefing. And uh, why they are so special? So when you see an advertisement on your mobile device, this is delivered through a web view, customized web view. They make heavy use of uh, this kind of web views due to the fact that advertisements are usually delivered like an HTML file, JavaScript, or any kind of web content. So they have to make that, right? So that was the main, uh, let's say, reason behind this research. How we, we wanted to identify how these uh, libraries make use of the web views, right? Some uh, nice resources if you want to perform your own research. Uh, this... Uh, uh, Google Play Store page where you can find info about uh, uh, all, all kinds of SDKs, not just advertisement SDKs, regarding their uh, uh, installation uh, by version or uh, retention by app and so on. So there are, there are very cool info there to perform your own research if you want. All right, so and some general things about them. Once again, they are easy to integrate. The only thing that you have to do, just add this I mean, the corresponding uh, dependency in your GAD file, and that's it. And when it comes to using them, they're super, super easy. So you can, uh, there is always, a, a, let's say, enough documentation when it comes to their usage. Uh, there, it's very easy to create an account. And you can, in, in simple words, you can have your, uh, let's say, advertisement account playing with just, in just a few days. Not days, even uh, hours. All right. OK, so let's go now through some showcases to put everything in action. So the first one that uh, we're going to talk about is an actual malware. It was actually characterized as uh, spyware and uh, Trojan. And uh, it was about a year ago that uh, Dr. Webb uh, posted, published a post about this uh, specific SDK, uh, which had the ability, among others, to um, collect information about files which are stored in the Android device, transfer these files to attackers, and substitute or upload clipboard contents. I'm reading uh, from another post, which uh, was, uh, let's say, adopted from the original Dr. Web post. So the specific SDK uh, is designed to maintain the user's interest, while on the background it does some creepy things, like uh, checking if the device is uh, actually VM or something. Things that we generally see only in malware. I mean, in most cases we see in malware, right? They try to identify the device as VM or something. Anyway, so as I said, this went popular pretty fast due to the fact that it had 420 million installs starting. And uh, it was about uh, Play Store. And when it comes to Play Store, things are getting popular very easy. All right, so let's go now through the actual post. So what it does, it communicates, when it is uh, initialized, it will communicate with a CloudFront server, and then it will uh, download or pull an, a JSON file which has some interesting settings. One of these settings is the command and control server address, which will be loaded in a custom web view. Now this web view has a JavaScript interface, which, uh, has some interesting methods. The first one lists files, which can apparently give you a list of the files of a specific directory. The other one can check if a file exists. And another one which can read the specific file and send it to, I mean, make it available at least, at least on the JavaScript side. Now, as the post uh, mentions here, as a result, JavaScript code, which is loaded from web pages to the specific web view, can access the user's files. And, and it did, it can, right? We saw how. Another thing, uh, it has read clipboard. Uh, it can read the user's clipboard data and can uh, set it. Although we don't need the JavaScript interface for that, we can do it with simple Java, JavaScript code. All right. And the same post has a full list of the methods which this uh, JavaScript interface exposes. So it has also methods that can be used in order to identify uh, if it is an actual device. I mean, characteristics about the device and so on. Finally, before we go to the showcases, to the other showcases at least, there is a list with all the apps that contain the specific uh, SDK. And I went through all of them 
not all of them, but at least the majority of them, and they were all banned from uh, Play Store. I'm not sure that uh, they were banned due to the fact that they contained the specific SDK, SDK, but I don't think it was a coincidence that all of these apps were banned, let's say, for different reasons and belong to the same list. All right. Uh, before I move to the SDKs, to the other SDK, uh, one thing that uh, I noticed in the post, I mean, because I went through, once again, there is no indication that this spin OK actually had some, uh, let's say, was actually performing that. There was no JavaScript code, at least, which was triggering the specific methods. At least, there's no such a thing mentioned in uh, the post. The post says that it had the ability to do that, but they didn't find, I mean, they, they didn't mention at least that they had the actual code which was doing that, right? Okay. Now, with that in mind, let's go to the first showcase, which has 300 million installs according to the Play Store page that I showed you before. So how this works? Once again, it will send an HTTP request to an external server. It will download the file, which is called controller script. It will save the specific file to the internal directory of the app. Now, if we decompile the code of the specific web view, I mean, the specific SDK, and we focus on the web view, we're going to see the following settings. So it has allow file access from, from uh, no, allow file access from file URLs, and universal file access, and file access. Which means, if you remember, that if a file is loaded to this web, uh, web view, then it can read other files, right? And not just files. Let's go uh, forward to the specific, let's say, uh, code. Then we see it calls a method which is called J. And this method will finally load the file which was downloaded, the controller file which was downloaded from the external server, All right? So, it communicates with an external server, it downloads a file, saves it locally, and loads this file to the web view. This web view has this file access, uh, file access from file URLs, universal file access. So simply said, it, it can read the user's files or the app's files without even JavaScript interface, without anything, right? Next one, uh, 500 mil million installs, starting from 500 million installs, is not clear. Right, and this one has the following. Once again, communication with an external server, downloads a file to the internal directory of the app, and this file is loaded to the specific web view. So this web view has uh, content access, JavaScript access, and file access. Now, don't be confused, in this case, it won't be able with these specific settings just to read something. So I said, okay, that's fine. I mean, that's Okay, although, moving a little, a little bit, uh, checking a little bit the code after, we, uh, we can see the following. Yeah, so it has a JavaScript interface which has 84 exposed methods uh, on the JavaScript side. Now, going through the specific JavaScript interface and the specific methods, we've seen the following. So it has a method which can delete a file, can delete a folder, and it has another method which can uh, retrieve information about the device. And uh, trust me, there is a lot of uh, detailed information about the device. It has another one, although I, I wasn't able to trigger it, so I didn't include it here, which uh, the name of this uh, method was uh, set allow file access from file URLs. Set, no, set universal access from file, file URLs. So I assume that uh, the JavaScript code was able to modify the specific setting from the web view. Uh, but like I said, I was not able to uh, trigger it, so I didn't include it here. All right, last but not least, uh, I kept the best uh, showcase. So this one starts from one billion installs, right? Starts once again. And uh, has the following. So it will start once again communicating with an external server. And it will download a file, an HTML file, which is called controller file. And this time it will save it to the external directory. So this is how it looks on the web view. It has uh, content access, JavaScript access, file access, file access from file URLs, universal file access. So it can do what, whatever it wants, right? Um, and 
Actually, I also verify that uh, with static core review. It has all these kind of things. And it's not just that. So if you go, I mean, if you uh, dive a little bit uh, deeper when it comes to the JavaScript interface regarding this uh, uh, SDK, so it has more than 200 functions exposed by the JavaScript interface. And these have the following uh, capabilities. Get device info, including uh, operating system version, brand, uh, free space, free memory, headset, I don't know. Why? Probably to identify if it's an actual uh, VM or something or device. Device volume, uh, get files, delete files, set file content, download file. And another interesting one, which uh, I don't know how this can serve, uh, I mean, an advertisement SDK. So it was able to send intents uh, using the ID of the app that it belongs to, right? So it was able to set everything, to set uh, the target um, uh, component, it was able to set um, extras, it was able to set everything. Simply said, it, it could start any other app using the identity, using the ID of the specific, of the app that had the specific SDK, I mean, the, which belongs to. And uh, here's a summary at least uh, regarding the cases that we saw. We saw quite a lot, but this, I mean, in 30 minutes, I don't have much time, I guess, to go through all of them. And these were the most interesting ones. And uh, on the top is the spin okay, the one that we said it's a malware, and the other ones that uh, I talked about. All right, I guess, yeah, that was quite far out. Anyway, so takeaways. Once again, uh, I explained that we performed this research due to the fact that, I mean, the main initiative was the fact that uh, uh, advertisements in the case make heavy use of web views due to the fact that they deliver advertisements through web views. So it makes sense for us to check this out. And uh, the other thing is what you see is not what you get, especially when it comes to web views. We saw that with just a few settings, I mean, someone can get the files, can do whatever it wants. I mean, you, and you can't identify that. You have to follow up, you have to monitor the specific SDK in order to be able to see something malicious, let's say, in this specific case. I guess, yeah, and I guess what, that was the point. Now you know, and uh, I hope, I mean, at least uh, people who are making such decisions to have these things under uh, their mind when they take uh, this kind of decision about SDKs. All right, and uh, yeah, that was the last one. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. We have a question already. Thank you for your presentation. C can you go back a couple of slides to that uh, one more, to the, the, the table? So. Here. Sending intent, intents, it's actually super valuable for an attacker. I think you should put it there. Uh, uh, the SDK tree, uh, do you have a sense if they do HTTPS validation? To do? Actually. HTTPS validation. Uh, because sometimes you find these uh, SDKs to, they don't do a validation at all, so they serve any HTTP page. And you do the man in the middle attacks, and you can have all this that you just described. With, with once, simple man in the middle. once again, this depends on the settings that the app has. So there is a specific setting when it comes to HTTP communication, which uh, by default doesn't allow HTTP communication. I mean, the the Android app with it doesn't allow normal HTTP communication. There is a specific setting, although developers once again can modify that and set clear text uh, traffic, yes. let's say, to force, and they can do that. Yeah, I mean, they, they can definitely do that, but again, it depends on the Android app, and not on the SDKs. At least in this case, they are not, I mean, something that's uh, relevant with this one. Okay? Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I have a question. Um, on day one, we had to talk about fingerprinting. Did you did you see the talk? I was presenting somewhere else, <laughs> and uh, I came yesterday, so I didn't much. I will I will watch the. Uh, All right. Yeah. Um, I think it's logical to assume that based on what you showed here, any app with these SDKs can fingerprint both the device and the user. Maybe. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. Well, so that's great. <laughs> Anyone else?
So he asked the question I was going to ask and follow on with here, basically. That, that's just fine. Because, so, assuming we can see all this and we can fingerprint, I, I didn't quite catch, aside from taking information from a user's device, okay, sorry, aside from, you know, dumping data off of the user's device and everything else, is it safe to assume uploading data for execution and everything to the device and then based off of fingerprinting and other things, basically, you know, being able to target a user from, from this kind of uh, uh, SDK and everything else and its capabilities? So, uh, I will, I mean, as you, as I mentioned before, it was, uh, when, when we were talking about the settings of the web view, just the settings of the web view, then this can be used to read, I mean, files and this kind of stuff. Now, if we combine that with a JavaScript interface, there's not, I don't think there is some kind of limitation what, uh, on what you can do, actually, right? You can get, if, you can even, um, as I showed you before, I mean, you can even perform some kind of code execution or something. So there is no, no limitation when it comes to JavaScript interfaces. All right. Thank you. Follow-up question, then. All right. Yeah. Given all these potential badness activities kind of things here with regards to this. The average user has what on their side that, you know, helps them to say, hey, uh, I, I do or don't want to download this app. I do or don't want to run this software. I mean, you know, I, I would presume not every AV vendor knows all of the particulars here to make an appropriate signature, you know, so what do we recommend to our users? Uh, this is mainly a, a decision that has to be made from the developer, as you understand. Now, when it comes to the users, uh, first thing first, I mean, uh, something that I always uh, say is don't download uh, uh, apps from, uh, I mean, places that you don't at least have some kind of, uh, to be more specific, let's say, from uh, just from Play Store or just to make sure that these are, uh, let's say, some kind, some kind uh, some, in some way checked. Now, uh, when it, I mean, if you mo download something like this from the Play Store and you see some kind of a behavior which is suspicious, like uh, I, I, the most, I mean, uh, obvious thing that I can't think about is just throwing uh, advertisements out of blue, out of the blue. So these kind of things can at least, uh, let's say, attract your um, attention. When it comes to advertisements, the case, right? When it comes to malware, there are a lot of things that you can indeed. But when it comes to these kind of things, yeah, I think advertisements and uh, you know pop-up windows, which yeah may <laughs> may, may may attract your attention in regards to that. Uh, are you saying that implicitly, if you download from the Google Play Store, the apps there cannot have these SDKs? No, they do actually have. They have one billion. They start from one billion installs. This SDK has adoption for the last one has adoption for one billion installs. I just wanted to make that clear yeah, because it, yeah. it sounded like you said uh, if you download no, from no, the Google. I mean, you know, just it's just at least a way to you know to because if you download from other sources, then things are going to be really, really bad. We were talking about really bad things. All right, worse. He means worse. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I, I just thought about something different. Um, the, from the perspective of a developer, are there any measurements one should take as be best practice to basically avoid having your uh, app um, captured by someone with malicious intents who, for example, knows the URLs you're calling and tries to uh, take one over to <laughs> load malicious code from your app? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, I mean, by the time that that, that, that was uh, actually the reason behind this uh, research, behind this presentation, uh, actually, the fact that we want to inform about, you know, what to to check for, right? So uh, if you check for, if you see that um, this is the case, have such a powerful web use and such powerful uh, JavaScript interfaces, I mean, then it's up to you, up to the developer to decide if he or she is going to expose uh, their users, right? That, that's the point. Okay. But there, there are no, like I said, there's something which is um, so dynamic that you, you have to, I mean, imagine that you have to monitor constantly the HTTP communication in order to catch something and say, oh, okay, that's something bad that they are doing, right? So we don't, we don't even have uh, proofs that they do something bad, right? They have the code there, the code is there. Yep. 
right? But we don't have proof that the, indeed they use that JavaScript interface or something. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Hmm? Thank you, Dimitrios. Thank you very much. Thank you.